down to earth level and let's talk about our instruments. So, I have uh, one instrument as an example, but we'll talk about the different types of them. Um, so, radiation detection instruments can give you um, units in detection events, or becquerels in other words. They can give you the unit in a, as a rate, the number of, uh, ex the amount of exposure per hour, for example, or you can get them that integrate. Integrating is take your rate, add it up over time, and give me a total, right? You drive 65 miles an hour and you drive for an hour, how far did you drive? Radiation detection instruments. You may not have it yet, that's fine. The notes do not match the PowerPoints, okay? They are not supposed to match the PowerPoints. They're supposed to be Important things, useful things, but they're not going to be verbatim a copy of the PowerPoints. The PowerPoint is the PowerPoint, right? So there's the textbook. PowerPoint's a subset of the textbook. The notes are a subset of the PowerPoints, okay? I encourage um, you guys to take handwritten notes as we're going through these, which is why I try to ahead of time provide you guys the PowerPoint so that you can um, take the notes ahead of time if you'd like to, right? Or um, have them up and available on a phone or tablet uh, ahead of time or, or during, during, the, during the class talk. But... Um, they're not they're not exactly the same and it's just it is uh it is difficult to transfer the powerpoint transcribe the powerpoint into these notes so some things get get lost and i take notes as i go through this to try to uh update these for future classes but you know it's once a year and so i update roughly once a year and so feedback is helpful i always appreciate feedback okay um good so anyways um our detection devices can detect in a number of events, clicks. They can add up those events to give you the rate, how much per hour. And then we can say, let's measure for an amount of time, how much radiation was that in total, okay? So the rate would be like, how fast are you driving? You're driving 65 miles an hour, right? The integrated, or the integral, would be, I'm driving 65 miles an hour, and I drove for one hour. So how far did I drive? 65 miles an hour, drove for one hour. 65 miles, right? Good. So that would be like integrating, right? Take the speed that you're driving and how far you drove, how long you drove for, getting a total distance, right? This would say, take what, how much you're being exposed to over time and how long you were exposed to it for and get a total amount, the integrated amount, okay? Okay. So uh, detection devices have uh, these four important characteristics to them. Sensitivity, <laughs> accuracy, resolving time, and range. Sensitivity, accuracy, resolving time, and range. Sensitivity is the ability to detect small amounts of radiation. This is what makes radiation detectors more or less expensive, primarily. Like my Geiger counter um, was not super duper expensive. Like you could go buy one of these. Not, it wouldn't, wouldn't break your bank, okay? The more expensive ones have larger detection chambers, okay? There'll be a bigger device with a larger detection chamber. A bigger detection chamber means you can pack more air into the chamber and so you can more sensitively detect ionization events. The smaller the detection chamber, the less sensitive it is. Then there's accuracy, the precision of the measurement. Now, accuracy is related to sensitivity, obviously, right? A very sensitive device can be very accurate. So accuracy and sensitivity can, in, in certain circumstances, be sort of put together. They're related to each other. The device is more precise when it's more sensitive. Accuracy, precision of measurement, is also related to resolving time. Resolving time is just saying, how quickly can I detect radiation events, right? Can I detect an event every second? 
Or can I detect an event every half of a second? Or can I detect events every millisecond or microsecond, right? The shorter my resolving time is, the more accurate my device is. So the most accurate devices are highly sensitive with very short resolving times. If I could only detect one event per second, my resolving time was one per second, right? But two things happened over that second, I'd only be able to detect one of them, right? I have a poor accuracy, in other words. Resolving time should be short, sensitivity should be high. Lastly, range. Range is not how far away it can detect the radiation from. Range is saying, how many different types of radiation is this instrument sensitive to? Like maybe our instrument's only sensitive to x-rays. And everything above or below that energy spectrum, it can't detect. Okay? Range is how sensitive it is to different types of radiation. Or different energy levels or different intensity levels. But the range is like what the machine is designed to detect. So I want to talk about some different types of, of detectors. Um, and we're going to start with the ones that, like, they don't give us any live readout. You can't get an answer every day from these detectors. These are the ones that we wear uh, as, ra as radiographers. So let's talk about these. The types of detectors that we wear as radiographers, and we'll get to the Geiger counter in just a little while here, but these types of detectors we wear as radiographers, they come in different styles. Let me bring it up. I'm going to bring up the picture of the three-ish different kinds. We have roughly three kinds of detectors. They go by the names of, and we'll try to do my best to explain these, OSL, or Optically Stimulating Luminescence Detectors, TLD, Thermoluminescent Detectors, and film badges. We have roughly three kinds of detectors that radiographers will wear. They all three, like you couldn't tell them apart really if, if I showed you one, right? You'd have to know what it, what it was ahead of time. Um, but they all three are used. They vary in the, in the cost. They vary in the accuracy of the measurement. And they vary in the use period, how long they can be worn for, okay? But um, regardless, they are all a way of measuring radiation um, dose over time. So these are integral detectors or integrating detectors. These measure a total amount of radiation over time. You turn this detector in three months from now, the company can't tell you when the exposure happened. They can only tell you um, how much, right? and to what parts of the body. That's pretty cool, though, because you wear it like right here on your lapel, and they can tell you where on your body um, the exposures were and how much each part of your body got. They can tell you how much the surface of the skin gets relative to the deep, deeper parts of your body, your thyroid dose, your eye dose. So they can infer these things based on where the badge is worn, which is kind of cool. So let's talk about these three types of detectors, OSL, TLD, and film. OSL stands for Optically Stimulated Luminescence Detectors. The, the description is telling you how the badge is read when it gets back to the company. They read the badge by, op <coughs> by optically stimulating it, and then it luminesces. In other words, when they get the badge back to the company, they put it in a special machine that shines a light at it, and it glows. And they read how much light comes out of it. Yeah, yeah exactly. These badges can be worn for long periods of time. Typically, it's about a, a one quarter at a time, three months at a time. They are typically a hexagon shape. Uh, and they can be worn for, again, up to a year. They are impervious to light, heat, moisture, and pressure. They are, in other words, hard to damage. 
and they're highly sensitive, making them accurate to tiny exposures as low as 10 microgray, which is very small. They can also be read by the company and then re-read. They can be re-stimulated multiple times to ensure an accurate reading. So these are really accurate devices. Um, again, most of the time they look a little like a little hexagon thing, and um, these are the best ones. These are the ones that we want to have um, if we're going to buy the best possible kind of uh, detection badge for radiographers. The second best, and not far behind, are called thermoluminescing detectors, or TLD badges. Those are what you guys have as, stu as students, the TLD badges. They're great. They work in a very similar way, except for when they get back to the company, they don't stimulate them with a light. They stimulate them with thermos, <laughs> thermal, right? They stimulate them with heat. They put them in an oven. So they put them in an oven and they light up instead of putting, instead of shining a light at them and they light up. So they use a crystal thing like lithium fluoride. And what happens is uh, the badge with the material in it gets exposed to radiation. The material will hang on to that energy until it gets back to the company. And then the company can stimulate the badge. The badge lights up and they can measure the amount of light emitted by the badge and infer the amount of radiation received. So as it said, when heated later in an oven, a process called annealing, which is just heating, um, energy is imparted to the trapped electrons in the material, allowing them to fall back into their orbits, emitting light in the process. Again, the thing you need to remember is they put them in an oven, the badges light up, they measure the amount of light let out from the badge. It's the same kind of thing as the OSL badges, just done with heat instead of light. Okay. Those are your TLDs. All of these use filters. So they'll put little tiny um, circles or squares of different materials, and then they can, they can put a couple different materials in, and they can tell, you know, behind the simulated bone, how much radiation did the badge receive? Behind the aluminum, how much did the badge receive, right? And they can use these different materials to infer how much exposure each part of your body received, okay? So simulated bone, aluminum, tin, copper, no filter at all. They use these different materials to infer dose to different parts of your body. All three types will use these different filter materials. Um, here, let's just zoom in a little bit. Here you can see like in the one on the right, which is now centered up, you can see those different like, like the arrows pointing at a little copper piece, right? So you can see they put little tiny squares of material, and then from those spots on the badge that hide behind those materials, if the radiation is getting through the material, you can infer how much radiation dose to some certain part of the body. These badges all, must always be worn facing forward so that the filters are placed in front of the, front of the um, part of the badge that detects the radiation. Uh, so they're between the source of radiation and the detector. And uh, that's why we always have them wearing with our name facing out. Lastly, are the film badges. So film badges use a piece of photographic film and in a sealed pack that upon exposure turns color. The film changes chemically when exposed to radiation. What they'll do then is at the company, the film is removed and they can use a device called a densitometer to tell how much the film has changed. From that, you can infer exposure. The densitometer measures how dark the exposed film is by detecting the ratio of light that can pass through it. An exposed film will transmit more light than the unexposed film. The problem with these is the chemical film is very sensitive to moisture, fume, chemi other chemicals, light, and heat. So these are the kind that if you leave them in your car, they're going to basically cook. Okay, The ultraviolet light gets through and they just cook inside your car. If you wash them and dry them, they get damaged. Okay, They are sensitive to all forms of 
heat and light and radiation. And uh, for, for that reason, as well as others, they're less accurate, but they are the cheapest. Okay, so if, if an, someone's trying to save money, then um, this is the way to go. They also have a very short use period of about one month because they're so sensitive to all these like external influences. Their use period is shorter. You know, uh, OSLs can go for a year, typically about three months. Your TLD badges go for three months. Um, these have to be re replaced every month. So you're getting more frequent badge exchanges, which may actually increase cost over time. Okay, that's good. We've got our, um, our integrating detectors, the ones that tell us over some period of time how much radiation were we exposed to. The problem with these is, is if for some weird reason I get exposed to a large amount of radiation, I don't know that until weeks or months after the exposure has happened, right? Um, so if I'm, a, if I'm a radiation physicist or I work at a, at a nuclear power plant or I work directly with radioactive materials, like, bless you, like I'm a nuclear medicine worker, right? Uh, radiographers can do nuclear medicine with special training. I might need to know how much radiation I'm getting like today, right? Okay, so there's different devices, including these kind called gas-filled detectors, okay? Uh, pocket dosimeters, ionization chambers, proportional counters, Geiger tubes are all gas-filled detectors. These can tell me how much is ge I'm getting, you know, in, in these short periods of time, like today or this hour or something like that. Yeah, these are for short periods of time, and these require um, really good self-monitoring and documentation. If I, for, if I put this, these are designed to be like pen-sized, worn in your pocket. If I put this in my, my, my chest pocket, right, and I forget to read it at the end of the day, then my measurement's gone, okay? If I, if I accidentally discharge it, because I'll explain that in a moment. But if I accidentally discharge it, the measurement goes away, okay? Uh, if I discharge it without remembering what it said, then it's gone, okay? My measurement's gone, and I don't know how much radiation I received. So, like, it clears out? Yeah. So they're not electrical. They're, um, they're very mechanical in how they work. I'll show it. And you just... only get one time to check it out? Or and then it, then you, it restarts, again. restarts again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So here's how these things work. So you can see that it's, it's basically a cylinder, right? It's a, it's a tube, a cylinder, okay? What you can't see in this picture is at the top of the tube, if you look down at the top of the tube, there's going to be a gauge. You guys doing all right? Okay. If you look down at the top of the tube, there's going to be a gauge at the top. So looking down at the top of the tube looks like what's down here in the bottom right corner. You get a little gauge, okay? And that gauge is going to have a, um, a, a, a meter on it that moves. Okay, what's actually happening here is like this. Inside of the tube is a piece of metal, a little thin foil leaf, okay? And that thin foil leaf starts basically attached to the far side, okay? So that thin foil leaf basically starts flat up against here, okay? And so when you look down, it's going to start that thin foil leaf that you can see like edge on uh, is, at the, is at like zero. Okay, the day, the day starts, the little foil leaf is all the way on one end of the tube, reading at zero, okay? Inside of here, inside of this chamber, are a bunch of air molecules, or some gas, it doesn't matter what the gas is, air or whatever, but it's a gas, okay? When radiation uh, strikes the gas, it ionizes the gas, it makes a little electric charge in the gas, okay? That electric charge builds up on the foil leaf, pushing pushing, as you see the arrow pushing down here, pushing the leaf, the little piece of foil, away from the wall of the chamber, okay? And so as more and more radiation gets recorded, that little foil leaf moves further and further and further and further towards the, the high end of the measurement, okay? So at any given time, you can look at where that little edge on, looking edge on that foil leaf, and you can see where it's at on your gauge, starting at zero, and moving up and up and up as you get more and more exposure, right? 
This one right now is reading at mi the middle between 50 and 100, so roughly <coughs> 75 milli gray. Later on in the day, between 200 and 300, now at 250 milli gray. Okay. At the end of the day, or the end of the use period, okay, they take the pen out of their pocket, they look at the gauge, they make a little entry in their logbook, and then they put it into a, a, a device that discharges it, that takes away all that built up charge, and that foil leaf goes back to zero. Okay. Tomorrow when they come in, take the pen out, put it in their pocket, and go about their business working with the radiation, documenting their exposure um, each, each use period, day or hours or however long they're around the radiation source. Um, the problem with them is, is that um, they have to be uh, discharged at the end of each use period and then the result has to be recorded. And if that doesn't happen, then the measurement's gone. Okay. I want to now talk about uh, the other, I've given a couple examples. A pocket dosimeter is great. Uh, I want to talk about the Geiger Mueller tubes, these ones. And we'll use our Geiger counter here. Okay. So, Geiger, Geiger counters or Geiger Mueller tubes, what you have is you have um, a detection device and then a way to uh, output, a way to output the recording. Um, often these are, are separate. You'll see this one as separate. Um, I've got a broken one that's, that looks like this. But this is the detection chamber up here in the, in the head of the thing, the thing that you hold over whatever source of radiation you want. And uh, this Geiger counter inside of it, somewhere in here, is a little, little chamber filled with gas. When that gas gets hit by radiation, it's going to click off. And right now it's, it's giving me the unit in counts per minute. That's how many decay events happen over a minute's time. And right now we're at about 11. Normally when I run this, it gets up to in the mid-20s per minute. Um, and and it, I can put this near near further than any one of you, near or further than me. You can put it out in the parking lot. It's going to measure roughly the same. This is measuring our natural background. Um, it can also, and oh, by the way, it's smart because it also gives me like, if I don't know how to interpret this, it just says normal right on it. I can also read out in microsieverts per hour, which is telling me 0 0.08 microsieverts per hour right now. If I put this around a source of radiation, which we may try to do in a moment here, this may change. So let's see. Good. So let's let this sit for a little while. Let's let it establish a baseline. Let's leave it on micro per hour. Let, us give it a, let it give us a baseline over there. So the way this is happening, what's happening here is that basically you've got a chamber, this chamber filled with gas, this gas subject to being ionized by radiation. You see some radiation coming in from the corner here striking some molecules, and all these little green lines are showing us ionizations <laughs> that are happening inside of the tube. When the, uh, when the gas inside the tube gets ionized, gets electrically charged, in other words, this pin down the center gets a small amount of electric current. Okay? So in every one of these detection chambers is a, is a metal pin running down the center. Okay? That pin gets a small amount of, a cur uh, of electric current with every ionization event. That electric current travels out, up the, up the pin, out into the, out into the machine, into the circuitry, and tells the thing to make a little audible click every time that happens. And it's also counting the amount of uh, total exposure, giving us a, a number in micro sieverts. These Geiger-Muller tubes use a gas called argon. If you look over on the periodic table, argon is going to be your third one down. It's on the very right side of the periodic table in a column. It's capital A, little r, in the column of noble gases. These are gases with all of their um, electron uh, shells full, so they're easy to ionize. So it's, it's, it's other, in other words, it's accurate. To, to they accurately detect ionization. Um, because of the saturation effect of the ion of ionizing the gas and it generating an electric charge, 
uh, after each ionization, ionization event, um, they have a long-ish resolving time when compared to other devices. Um, so they're, they're less accurate than others because of the long resolving time, but they are pretty sensitive given, um, given the size of their chambers. The larger chamber is more sensitive. They're good at detecting alpha, and beta, and gamma emissions. They're very poor at detecting x-rays. Okay, so these are, that one's not good for uh, as an x-ray uh, dosimeter. Um, and they record things in, as clicks. So what we've got, we've got a couple pieces. This is a nice little piece. This is an older, um, it's okay to hold this, by the way. I'm not going like, to die from holding this. Uh, it's an older piece of uranium glass. Mm -hmm. And you can tell this is uranium glass. If you shine an ultraviolet light on it, it, it basically glows, mm -hmm. okay? So this, uh, this used, I mean, it's a nice pretty green color, which is why they like the stuff, but uh, it's uranium glass. So let's see, uh, before I go over there, before I put turn it over, we're at 0.14 microsieverts per hour. Let's see if our uranium glass reads nice at all. I actually don't know. Uranium glass. Yeah. Yeah. This is our count per minute. So we're at 0.15. We were averaging 23 counts per minute. Now we're up to 27. Now it should be frequently more. Which is interesting. Let's see if it does a little bit. See what it, see what it, see what it says when we come back. So we were at 0.15 microsievert per hour. So we were at 23 counts per minute. We'll come back to it in a little bit and we'll check it. Okay, well that's finishing doing its thing. Let's sort of round out what we've talked about today and I'll get you guys out of here soon. So, for personnel monitoring, for because that's not going to be monitoring you in your x-ray room, right? That's just for show here at, this, at the school. What's going to actually monitor you as far as radiation exposure in your x-ray room, it's basically going to be one thing and that's going to be your badge. Okay, we call your badge a dosimeter. Um, so we have three different types of dosimeters depending on who you are, right? If you're a radiographer, you're going to wear one of these first two, okay? If you're a radiation physicist, nuclear <coughs> medicine worker, someone who's working around higher quantities of radiation, then you may wear the third one or one of the other first two. So you may wear any of the three. So let's look at these. Advantage versus disadvantage. Your OSL and TLD badges, high resiliency. The disadvantage is they're expensive. They're accurate, they have long use periods, they're hard to hurt, but they're expensive. Film badges. <laughs> I like how the film badge, its advantage is a disadvantage. <laughs> its advantage is it's susceptible to heat and fumes. <laughs> um, they really don't have any good advantages. Film badges are not great. Um, the reason why they still exist is because they're cheap. Okay. Um, they are less accurate, less resilient, and have shorter use periods than OSL and TLD badges. Um, the only real advantage is cost. I would have just put cost in here if I were if I were writing if I were the author. Disadvantage is same as the, same as the advantages. It, they're just not great. Uh, if you can avoid them, if any um, uh, company can avoid using them, they probably should. Okay. Um, if we want to do things accurately, these two OSL and TLD are going to be the way to go. Your last one, pocket dosimeter, immediate readout, right? That's the main advantage. We get it. We get an answer now. The disadvantage is they're, they're not accurate. Well, they are accurate if, if handled appropriately, right? But jostling around, bringing them next to electric charges, um, forgetting to take your measurement, right, are all reasons why these would, these would not be that accurate. But that's their only main disadvantage is that they're inaccurate under certain circumstances, including misuse. And it's hard. Like, it's, a, it's like a pen in your pocket, right? That's going to get just bumped around sometimes. And so because of that, they can be less accurate. Importantly, and I think this is a very important note, um, all types of personal monitor, person, sorry, the way they interchange personnel and personal. Uh, all types of monitors to monitor personnel um, are sensitive to background radiation. Okay? So... Every badge, uh, every group, every um, shipment of badges will come with what's called a control badge. Okay? The control badge does not come out of the box. Okay? 
The control badge is shipped with the badges, stays in the box, it's labeled control, and it says do not use right on it. Okay? And what will happen is it's going to monitor the background radiation being received, and the company can subtract that background radiation from what your badges receive. Right? So we can measure the background, measure what your badge gets, subtract out the background from yours, and get a true measurement of what you actually received occupationally. Nice. Yeah. Because, you know, um, they might fly in an airplane to get here, right? Might be shipped, have to get shipped to the Midwest or something, right? So they fly in an airplane, and we know at higher altitudes we're exposed to more radiation, right? We learned that last time we talked. Um, they may be in hot environments, <laughs> uh, things that can affect the badges in, in certain ways. And so by having this background measurement, you can just ensure that we're not including any of that in the occupational, in the reported occupational dose. So, yep, control monitor used for comparison. All right. Let's see what we got. <laughs> it is lower. That's pretty funny. Uh, yeah, so it's averaging 18 counts per minute right now and 0.12 microsieverts per hour. So, even though this is uranium glass, we know it's radioactive because it contains radioactive uranium. What can we say about it? It's not harmful. It's not harmful because it's measuring lower than the natural background, right? In, in, in effect, we can't measure lower than that, the natural background. Effectively, we're just measuring the natural background. Sorry, sorry, sorry. This, this cannot be distinguished in this in this particular instance. I've, I've used these before, not this exact piece, but I've used these before that do measure significantly above the natural background. And um, this happens to be one of them that, that doesn't. So there we go. Good experiment. Fun. All right, guys. Um, please. Let's see, what, we got? what do we got? Next Friday, we've got our final to do, okay? Come ready to take the quiz on these two, sorry, take the final exam on these two chapters. You should all have the test bank by now. Remember, I'm gonna take about 50 questions from that test bank and give them to you as the final, okay? No surprises. Um, if anyone has questions, stick around. Ooh. Um, let me go run, a, I wanna run a copy of your quizzes so I can just hand them right back to you. Stick around, let me get these quizzes back to you. Yes, mom. Quiz? You want your quiz back? <laughs> I can I have to. Have a good day.
Somewhere, there you go. All right, uh, Jasmine and Justine. So your, I know. I might call around and see what's your, um, you know your lifetime joke? That was, this that, is my, that was my lifetime. That's your lifetime. It was roughly 2,500 million men. Yeah. Um, and your, what's your, what's your, what's your, so 40, 430 micro, micro? Micros? I'm, I'm really curious if, if you're. I never remember these unless I'm like talking directly right. about it. I have one of the delicates at 7,500. Yikes. So you're not the highest one? No. Interesting. No, yeah, it's 10 yeah. million. Thank you. That's your lifetime limit. That's how much you have, 25 million sieverts, no, okay, and your lifetime is 430 million sieverts. Okay. So it should be good. You're good. Yeah. You're Even right. if I call around and get the rest of my stuff. Yeah, I, I think still you'd have to, you'd have to, I mean, you're, it's a, it's a chunk of it, right? It's yeah. a, you know, mm -hmm. But I'm getting out of it. It's sad. Yeah. But yeah, no, one okay. of our girls, she's a... How long, and how long has she done, uh, like, does it say the inception period? It's usually on the right-hand side of the... I don't know, they really cut it off. I just had someone send me a picture. The inception quick. period will tell you how long you've been me measured for. Too. Okay. So you can divide that out and see how, how much you've had per year on average. Yeah. yeah. Well, she's retirement age period. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, if she's done it for a long time, then yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait, well, <laughs> how long do you think that's that covers? How long do you think that period? Ten years. Ten years. Okay. That's two hundred fifty milli milligrams per year. Two point five milli mm -hmm. per. Okay. Yeah. No. That's not oh, that bad. I mean, I'll have to look when I get exactly. It's two point five milli per day. year, which is oh. roughly the average for a radiographer. Yeah. 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 I'll have to look when I go in on Monday. But it's it's we'll significantly more than we typically see, but it's not any, I know, anywhere. I like with these numbers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's those big numbers, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's nowhere near approaching, like, you have to stop doing x-rays or anything like that, which is cool. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's not nothing. That's cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I set up a day to have, like, tutoring? Sure. Because I need it really bad. Yeah, um, what I would do is, because um, you're only here... Friday, what I would do is I would try to put yourself on here mm -hmm. and then just uh, do something so you and me both know that it's not a lab. Okay. These are these are effectively these are my available times to do things. Okay. And um, can I just pick a day? Yeah. And then I can just stay a Friday. Yeah. And just like an hour. And you know, just honestly, kind of like me. if I don't have if even if it's like a day that looks like there's a bunch of people. If I don't have a brand new group, you know, like if I have like a brand new group of people, I have to be like right on with them. Yeah. But anyone who's been with me before, I can effectively leave them alone to do lab. To do I, can, I can kind of do both tutoring okay. and lab. What do you so, um, suggest? You like put, those so, two girls? Yeah, so these guys, they're, 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 they've been here a while. Okay. Um, they've I'll been here a while. You guys have been here long enough to do lab just by yourself. But of course, you don't want to do it the same day you're here. So honestly, any one of these would be okay. Cool. Go and pop um, yourself on any one of yeah, those times. Yeah, I will. An asterisk or something, I don't know, under it, but yeah, that's fine. Can I ask you to resend those um, notes to me? 
Yeah, um, I did. It's like I'm the only one that actually oh, seen them, okay. and I did one, but I'm gonna check to my email. Yeah, I, I could have just.